Pastor Bill Evans, Jetwin Fellowship Baptist Church. Uh, actually, you're stepping down from the pulpit soon. I got a new young fellow coming along. Uh, end of uh, uh, first of June for him, for end of May for me. And uh, but I'm excited to be part of having been part of the Jetwin TV uh, Christian Ministries that we have here. And thanks to Marlon and company that run it all for us. And uh, so um, we just, it's just wonderful to, be able to have this opportunity. We have our messages that the church are all up on YouTube anyhow, but these is uh, certain people that can't do all that and Chet TV ministers to those. And I know that that happens around the community. So we're, we're thankful for those situations that we have here, this one here. My cons, cons, matter, subject matter today is uh, in Galatians 5.22, there's a description of the fruit of the Spirit. And it says, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, he says, is, um, he says but, the fr the king, uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against these things, there's no, such, there's no laws made. The fruit of the Spirit. He does not say fruits of the Spirit are these things. He says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and, and all these facets that we have here. The Spirit of God has many facets uh, in, in, in showing up in people's lives. It shows up in love, joy, peace, and whatever. And that varies in people's lives as you know them. But I was thinking uh, about the concept of holiness, working through the book of Leviticus and wondering, does holiness have the same concept of facets on it and uh, whatever? So I, I worked that through. Uh, I do not believe the Bible teaches that in this life we can practice perfection. First um, John 1 verse 8 says that, he says, if, if you uh, say you have no sin, you're deceived. And there's people running around, well, I don't have any sin. Yeah, you do. You're lying to yourself. You've been deceived by the devil that you're perfect. And there was only one perfect man. And in the Easter story, they crucified him. And uh, so here we have, there was nobody ever perfect. You only, you're deceived. Um, verse 8 to 10. Verse 8 says, if you're that, if you're, and he carries on there, but smack in the middle of the verses that says, you're lying, you're, you're lying to yourself, you're deceived. And the other part is verse uh, 9 that says, if we confess our sins, the blood of Christ keeps on, the Greek has the idea, keeps on cleansing us from sin. So we're challenged to keep coming back. Um, as far as there's a thing called positional theology, that if you have a relationship with Jesus, uh, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, he comes and lives inside you. When, you. when that happens, he's got Bill Evans seated like he's sitting there in heaven already. I, I just turned 70 and I'm, uh, you know, I don't know how many years I got, uh, whatever, but he sees me as already seated there because I have a faith relationship with him and his spirit works in my heart. So he puts me down as, as described, we call that positional theology. My position in Christ is I'm already there. But right down here, I keep just stubbing my toe and skinning my knees and banging my finger with my hammer. Um, and, and, and I get through all those things. But here I am. So we want this morning to consider the, today to consider the facets of holiness. And the first thing about it is, um, uh, is uh, that it's a command to saints. Uh, one of the famous uh, Christian singers says, uh, holiness, it's God's command, not his request. And how he words it in his scriptures, 1 Peter 1.16, he tells, us, tells the people there to be holy. Um, and uh, how he words it, uh, verse 16, he says, uh, he, there it is, because it is written, you shall be holy. Why? Because God says, because I'm holy. And if you and I are going to walk together, how can two walk together unless they're agreed, God says. So you need to be holy because if you're hanging with me because I am holy. And so he makes that statement there. And then he goes back to verse 2, how this happens. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. And so that, that concept there, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. And how does it happen, he just said? To the obedience, to the um, oh, to obey Jesus and what He has commanded in His Word. Um, if you don't know the laws of the road, you shouldn't be driving. You're supposed to know them. And uh, black and white is law. Black and orange is suggestion. You can't really get a ticket for uh, missing a curve on the road when the arrows hit turn. But if you're in the ditch, you can do whatever. Black and white is law. Black and orange is a suggestion, slow down, there's a sh steep curve ahead and whatever, or, or a suggested speed because of the bumps and whatever. And so here he has the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus. The Spirit of God, when we come to Christ and become Christians, he wants us then to follow with the Spirit of God's help in our lives, follow what Jesus tells us in his word. Guess what? 
You got to read the word in order to know what it is and uh, such. So he says there, the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Back down to verse 13 in this first Peter, he says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be, keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. People say, I get afraid of dying. I heard something the other day. It was in the coffee talk, I think, or somewhere. Somebody posted it said, People have these two great fears. The first one is, is they're afraid to speak in public, in, in front of people. And the second one is dying. So then somebody put that together. So if you're at a funeral, you'd rather be in the casket than be doing a eulogy and uh, whatever. That's interesting. He says, keep sober and hope for the complete, hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus. You don't get grace to die until you're ready to die. And God will give that to you then. So he says, and he goes on there, verse 14, he says, Obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust which you uh, did ignorantly, but like the Holy One who has called you, be holy yourselves also in your behavior. Why? As we said, God says, be holy because I am holy. He's not making a suggestion. He's making a command upon your life if you say you're a Christian. So that's the command of saints. The challenge to saints then is that in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3, he says, um, and the Greek has it, this is the, this is the will of God, uh, the, the sanctification of you. God says, this is my will, that you be sanctified. You be saint. You be made like a saint. You be somebody that walks in holiness before the world, and you're in my name. You're, you're walking in fellowship with me. Two can't walk together unless they agree. You have to walk in holiness, and that's your sanctification there. In John 14, 23, there's an interesting statement, and let me flip there because it's really good. Um, is what he, Jesus says. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me and shows his love to me, that God, that's pretty cool what I found about you and your word. And I look around creation, I see the beauties and the wonders and all those things. And it's pretty cool what I, when I come and say that, acknowledge that you're there, you meet with me and you, you bless me. He says, uh, Versus, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. You keep my word, keep digging in it, keep looking in it, keep obeying it. And my Father will love him, and we will come and make our abode in him. God says, me and Jesus are going to come and live inside you. How? By the Holy Spirit. We will live in your life. And what that fruit of the Spirit we talked about is, you'll start loving people. You, you hated your neighbor because he had a dog that messed on your lawn. You start to love that neighbor. And, and you'll have peace that, uh, you know, uh, well, there's some bills that I can't, haven't got all the money today, whatever. God says he'll take care of my needs. And you have peace about those things. And so he, he, he says that, uh, he does, when you love me, he says, I'm going to come and live in you. My son and I will come and live in you. And we'll start bringing up uh, peace and joy and love. And joy is wonderful. Well, who doesn't want joy? Well, there's a few crotchety persons. They like to say, they think instead of putting uh, milk on their cereal, they put uh, grape juice, grapefruit juice. And, uh, but we want to have joy. And God says, my spirit will come and bring joy to your life. And that's, of course, been the home saver of many people's lives over the years. When people come to know Jesus, he moves into their lives and their lives change and they become much more lovable and friendly to be around. So all holiness and saintliness stems from obedience. And so um, that's important. The, the challenge to the saints is this is the will of God, your sanctification. And Jesus says, why? Because I'm going to come and live inside you and I'm not going to live in some dirty home. You've got to clean it up, and there we are. The characteristic facets, then, of this sanctification. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 has an interesting one. And um, he says there's just some things. 2 Corinthians 6, he says in verse 16, he says there's just some things. He says, um, uh, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Now, the temple of God, why? Because he's living inside you. He just said, we'll come and make our abode. If you're the temple, he's living inside the temple. He says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? And what is an idol? Well, you can have something that you carve or whatever, but, and whatever, but it's, it can be your job. It can be your wife. It can be your, your, your kids. It can be your, 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 your best toy that you like. All those things, they become idols. And we worship them more than worship God. He says, be careful. He says, what agreement has the temple of God where I live uh, with, with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So what he calls for there is saintly separa separation. Sa saintly separation. Uh, some people are only known by what they don't do. But no, you have to think things through, and you have a mind, and God give you the, the mind of Christ, and you can think things through. And those, there will be some, some things that you can do that I can't. 
and I got liberty. I, I'm not a big person on going to the movie houses. I don't lose my salvation if I go. It's just not my thing. I'm a little hyperactive to sit that long. But some guy, oh, if you go to, go to a movie house, you, you lost your salvation. No, that's not my case. That's not our case. And so it's saintly separation is just things you don't do. And if God doesn't give you liberty in your heart, because again, he's in there, he'll direct those things for you, there you will be. Uh, Leviticus 11, 45, made, God made this statement. I brought you out of the bondage of Egypt for me. Not just to have bring you out in the wilderness, let you go, and, and you're not going to be shot at by the Egyptians. I brought you out. He says to serve me. I brought you out for me. God has made us in his image for himself, not for ourselves. And we need to get our heads around that. In Psalm 139, verse 6, he, he talks about, uh, is an interesting angle there. And um, I'll just read it to you quickly. Um, 39, verse 6, he says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it's high, I cannot attain to it. One of the things to be careful of in our holiness as a facet in our lives is not try to bring God down to a little box so we can understand him. You got to fit in my little box here, God, and you don't fit. Well, that doesn't make sense to me. I can't believe in you. God does not ask you to bring him down. He asks you to look up and raise up and adore him and worship him because you can't really grasp him. And then later on in that psalm, he talks about scrutiny that says, Search me, O God, and know my heart, and, and try, my, try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me, and then lead me in the way of everlasting life that's going to provide good and blessing for me and others around me. That's his desire in our lives. Unattainable knowledge, separate, beyond comprehension. Don't bring God down. He, Leviticus 10, verse 3, that God says, I want to be honored, I want to be glorified. And Isaiah 42 uh, had that very statement made there. That um, Isaiah 42 and verse 8, what God says right here in his words, I am the Lord, that is my name. And uh, I will not give my glory to another, nor will my praise to be graven images and uh, whatever. It's just, I am the Lord. I'm the self-existent God. I don't give my glory to another. And if he comes and lives in our hearts, he says, hey, remember the dirty house he doesn't want to live in? There's things that got to go. Deal with them. Your TVs, your, your idol, because you can't do anything but watch TV and sports and all that stuff. That's your idol. God says it's not going to work anymore if we're holding hands, walking together. And then Proverbs verse 6, let me leave you quickly with a couple of thoughts here. And it says, um, Proverbs 6, God says there's things in holiness to hate. And we should hate what God hates. Some people say, oh, don't hate anything. Thank you. And he says, there are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, proud eyes. You know, you, whatever. Uh, that look. A lying tongue. God says, I hate these things. And he says, uh, a lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. Don't kill somebody who does not deserve to be killed. Don't kill things that don't deserve to be killed. God says, I hate that. A heart that devises wicked plans. And people sit around and Proverbs 1.10, My son, if, if sinners entice you, come along and put you in your lot with us. He says, we'll do this. He says, run away from that. Feet that run rapidly to do evil. Lots of that in the world. Come on, we'll be evil. Why? Let's go get drunk, and drug, drugged out or whatever. And what's going to be outcome? We're going to do evil. And then he says, a false witness who, who utters lies. And one who spreads strife. Be a person who tries to bring friendship and love to people rather than those. God says, I hate those things. If we want to be holy, we've got to hate those things too. Romans 1.21 makes this one statement. He's describing the awfulness of the people of God and people of the world. And, and he's pointing out their deficits and their problems. He makes this one statement as I close. He says, and neither were they thankful. Being thankful is such a wonderful thing of the holiness of God in our lives. Practice those things. Holiness has many facets. And obedience and uh, finding the word, follow it. That's his desire for our lives. He, he commands you, be holy, because he's holy. Thank you. God bless you.